<laughs> so, um, you know, I, Bali was fun because the Shaivites and the Vajracharyas, you know, the Tandrakas from Shiva and the Vajracharyas are supposed to be mutually present with the king whenever they do a serious ritual. So they have a very, they still have what I think ancient India had, it's a very friendly relationship. You know, there's some philosophical arguments, of course, what goes on, but that goes on among the Buddhists and among the Hindus with each other as well. But there wasn't this big gulf that you feel in India nowadays. It was, uh, and Bali some has a little, Nepal a little bit has that feeling, and, and no, Bali really very much so. Southeast Asia in general, like, like I know in, in Thailand, they, you know, it's dominantly, you know, a Buddhist culture, but they yeah. used, you know, the, the Brahmin influence. It was just... Sure. And all the rituals, they would use Brahmin. They did, but up until the 14th, I think, or 15th century, mm -hmm. Uh, most of the Southeast Asian countries had Mahayana and Vajrayana, and therefore they were they that got along with the Brahmins and the royal rituals. But then the, later, there's some stuff happened, and then the Sri Lankan came in with a sort of very rigid Theravada thing that makes them very nervous. Like if you give a talk in Bangkok, in like Buddha Data Archive or something, one of the sort of most liberal places, and you talk Mahayana, they kind of think it's fun. But you mentioned Tandrayana and the monks take a hike. Yeah. They do, they like say, oh, excuse me, you know, afraid some female might come and get them or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, it's a problem. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and, but they're beginning, like that we had here just now with the doctor, we had a young Thai guy who was really wanting to study Tandrayana and Mahayana and stuff, and he was saying that there's a movement that he's going to be part of it, blah, blah, blah. But the monks are still pretty terrified of it. You know, the Sri Lanka kind of orthodoxy. Sri Lanka itself had Vajrayana and, uh, and Mahayana, actually. Actually, before, up to the 10th, 11th century. It's all about wiped out. Because they're too, too peaceful, you know. Had to get conquered. Yeah. Yeah, that's true also in North India, too. Sorry? I mean, in, in India. Yes. No. Yeah. What happened? They were steamrolled. Well, they were steamrolled by a bunch of Tajiks and yeah. Uzbeks and Iranians and uh, not mainly the Arabs. The Arabs were there a long time before trading with boats and things. Oh, no. yeah. But the actual land invasions were were, Indo -European. were newly, mostly newly converted to Islam and therefore unified by Islam. Oh. And therefore, uh, tribal sort of Turkic types, you know, Tajik, Uzbek, Hazaras, people like that. Pashtuns, you know, yeah. the, you know, the famous Pashtun. So because yeah. Islam made them tribal fighting, instead of fighting each other, they got unified and they conquered everything. Yeah. You know, sorry, you know. So there's new, newly converted people are more dangerous. Pretty much, yeah. And of course, the wealth, of not only of the Buddhists, but the Hindu temples and the Buddhist things, like that I was just reading about the Chinese guy, was just unbelievable. You know, the giant golden Shivas and Vishnus and Buddhas and female Buddhas and you know, really gold and gold, crusted with jewels and huge golden stupa, like, it's incredible, the wealth, of, you know, that attracted people to India. It's amazing. And so, and that, I think, Babar and these, um, these conquerors, they would, they, they, there are Muslim records that add up the metric tons of jewels and gold and stuff that they would take out of the temples, Hindu temples too. They destroyed thousands of them. But they couldn't destroy Hinduism because they couldn't destroy the villages because they needed the people to work in the villages and then the caste system was convenient to keep them from rebelling. And, but the Buddhist monasteries, they totally destroyed, burned all the books and the monks. And uh, that's, so that's a big change. You know. But luckily, the knowledge had fled up into Tibet. So really, like, uh, I'm a very, you know, uh, very devoted to Dalai Lama, and Dalai Lama always said he is a son of Nalanda. Do you all know what Nalanda is? Nalanda was the great Indian university of the first millennium, even beginning before in the BCE centuries, uh, which core faculty were mostly Buddhist monks, but they were, and a lot of them were from the Brahman or Kshatriya class, of course, themselves. And then also Brahmins studied there, and they had medical schools, and they had architectural schools, and they had you know, drama schools and poetry schools. I mean, it was not just the dharma. It was all different kinds of sciences and things like, it was like the Oxford or Harvard or something of the time for a thousand years. 
and it was completely burned down in 1172 by Bakhtiar, a guy called Bakhtiar. And uh, all the well, amazing temples, all the gold and everything were taken. They burned all the books. The books burned for six months or something. Mm -hmm. But luckily, thousands of them were translated into Tibetan. And that's what we were trying to do. This one did survive in Sanskrit, the, the, uh, the uh, Kao Chakra. And maybe I'll try to get some of the verses out of the scan that I have of the Kao Chakra text. So you can chant that or we can read that later. I have 21 verses here that will slowly work up and explain in the such some sessions what the, all this means. You know. They have this odd idea that the lady wisdom, uh, I, I'm mistranslating here, I should have said, immaterial yet manifesting matter. The, that uh, the Mrs. Kala Chakra, whose name is Vishwamata, that she, her body has no atoms. It's not only a pure mental body, it's an energy body, but it is a level of energy where there's no atoms. The atoms are too coarse. And actually also the Kawasaka does, which is a really interesting concept. I'm very fascinated by it. You know, if you think that your, your body, do you think your body is made of atoms, for example? I was thinking about this because I've been looking into this topic. We, we would be told, right, by a doctor, well, you have molecules, or oh, your DNA, oh, you have this bad DNA, you better, like, amputate your elbow or something. Like that. <laughs> we have a grow in it. You know what I mean? So we think we have cells and molecules, and we're in meat space, right? What they, what they call meat space. Right? <laughs> That's where we are. We're in meat space. And this is the meat, this is meat. Okay, but now wait. And if you. I, I read this thing. Sir so Arthur Eddington in 1924 wrote a book which he said, this whole world is an illusion. He said, I have two desks in my study. One is a wooden desk with the papers on it that I write, and one is a, just a you know, visual collection of atoms. You know, and I sort of keep my thoughts on that one, because they can't let, 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 nothing will rest on it, because you know, the atoms are empty, right? There's, you know, there's a nucleus, an electron, it's really not, nothing there. Yeah. He even wrote that. That was before major quantum. Now with quantum, they're desperately down there chasing the Higgs boson. You, you, you saw that in the newspaper last summer, right? They really freaked out, the men mostly, physicists. And they're trying to find out why there is a sense of mass. You know, how does it happen? Because everything keeps coming apart. Totally falls apart. And then they get down to light particles. And then really weird shit happens. <laughs> Spooky action at a distance and something spinning like my black holes make you know, things and you can feel it at century, like light years later. I mean, it's so weird. They can't see on it. So they want something that will give the mass of the visible spectrum of the universe, which is only 3% of the matter. The yang part is only 3%. No wonder males are insecure. <laughs> the dark matter and dark energy is 97%, and they haven't seen it yet. Are they in control or what? <laughs> right? So the, this the idea is, what I'm, what I'm saying is, actually, we could go to the level of atoms even, and we'd be, our, our meat space hand would be mostly empty space, <laughs> with something swishing around in it. But then actually those things come apart, those electrons and those things, and finally we get to the photon, which is light, and it's moving at its own speed, so it's at that boundary where, as a particle, if it hits the, its speed, its own natural speed, mass is infinite, so it's everywhere. It's like the clear light of the void. Yeah, so each right? point is at the front. Right? Each point is the whole thing. Yeah. It's just like some of these books. Those exactly. Books. So. That means that we're actually made of light, too. But she is formally made of light. So, you know, they're, they're conceding that we think we're in meat space, and we're trying to get out of it or something, and we're trying to understand it or whatever. You know, we're dealing with being meat for something to devour, you know? <laughs> you know, the universe to devour, and death through death, or you know, aggression or whatever. And so that's why we're so like worried about everything. But actually, Everything is actually just pure light, and somehow we've configured it through our ignorance into this, this lumpy stuff, this idea. So the idea is that she, that's what it, I said form, because in the old days people translated rupa, 
which can mean a visual object, and that's why the translators always translate a rupa as form, because it means rupa comes from rup to make a mark on something. So rupa, a verb, you know. So rupa means form as a visual object, but as matter itself, you know, like even invisible matter, like wind or something, that's also rupa. So that one should be translated matter. So she, immaterial, I, I was following the old thing, I should have. She, immaterial, still manifesting matter. So the idea, therefore, that Kawasaki tells us is that enlightenment means where you live consciously from the state of being pure light. And you could manifest your, you could manifest matter in meat space to engage with beings trapped in meat space who seeking liberation and seeking happiness. I mean, they're not seeking liberation, except they think they'll be happy, right? Seeking happiness, right? So, so bliss, seeking bliss, right? Isn't that what everybody's seeking, right? <laughs> so isn't that fun? I like that. I'm very liking that. 